So I want to say thank you to everyone for joining us tonight um, for our butterfly gardening class. We're very excited to have you. Um, we're doing our Think Green, Be Green classes, our environmental classes. Um, they're up and running again. They're all here on Zoom virtually. So thank you for um, adapting with us and doing these online classes with us. We really appreciate it. Hopefully one day we'll be in person again. Um, but we have more coming up, so make sure you check the City of Irving Think Green, Be Green page and always check your city spectrum and you'll see all of our classes and events we have coming. I know the Parks and Rec Department is doing a lot of fun online things. The libraries are doing a lot of fun online things. So we're still having lots of fun programs from the safety of home. So anyways, uh, without further ado, we have an awesome speaker here today. She's done many talks for us and always gets requested. So Ms. Joyce from Marshall Grain is going to be speaking about butterfly gardening. Um, and throughout the presentation, if you have questions, put them in the chat or the Q&A, and then at the end, we'll answer them all together. But you can put them in it throughout the presentation if questions come to mind. So, all right. You want to go ahead and take it away. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. This is always a pleasure. Um, welcome to uh, my talk on the fall monarch butterfly migration. I'm Joyce Connolly. I'm co-owner and marketing director of Marshall Grain, and I've been studying organic gardening now for over 15 years, um, taking a variety of courses in it and just learned from doing and uh, working with people in the uh, industry. Um, and my special uh, area of expertise is in what I call backyard biospheres, which is a concept that shows how we can reverse the decline of monarchs and other native wildlife by turning our backyards into wildlife sanctuaries. So although we're focusing on monarchs today, I want to make sure you understand that um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about applies to uh, other butterflies and other uh, insects and other wildlife in your garden. So um, all of these creatures are interconnected and work together with each other to make our gardens functional and beautiful. So I'm going to start off by giving a little bit of background on monarchs and uh, we'll discuss uh, their, their life cycle and so forth. Uh, we'll talk about what kind of plants they need and uh, how to work those plants into your landscape. Uh, as this picture shows, uh, I think you can see pretty well. Uh, this is uh, an area right outside our store. It's a very small little um, uh, island, parking lot island, that we have turned into a monarch way station. So I just wanted to show you this because um, it's actually not necessary for you to have a great big garden in order for you to garden for butterflies. Uh, you can have just a, a small patch like, like this in this picture. Uh, and uh, fit everything that a monarch would need for their entire life cycle in that little patch. So you don't need a whole lot of space. Uh, I'll also talk about other resources um, uh, to make monarch watching more fun for both you and your kids and your grandkids. And uh, so first of all, uh, one of the most important things about um, monarchs and all of our butterflies for that matter, is that uh, the monarchs are, um, the monarchs that live east of the Rocky Mountains used to number in the hundreds of millions. Uh, but their population has declined over the last 20 years by 80%, which is just huge number in a very short period of time. And most of that um, is attributed to to lots of habitat, that is, um, you know, urban development and that sort of thing, uh, and the use of, of chemical herbicides and pesticides like glyphosate and so on. Um, but so several groups are coming together and working together with farmers and ranchers and, and park managers and individual residents like us uh, across the eastern U.S. 
uh, to plant butterfly gardens, particularly milkweed for the um, uh, host plant for the uh, caterpillars. And uh, so as a gardener, you can actually participate in this and contribute to habitat restoration by turning your garden into a pollinator friendly space. Uh, it, you know, it may not seem like a big deal for you to have just, you know, one garden um, uh, being, being butterfly friendly, but, but through programs like the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge, uh, we have been able to recreate millions of acres of butterfly habitat. So that's significant when you add it all together. So um, uh, don't feel like you have to have a big garden or, um, or that your garden is insignificant because strung together into a backyard biosphere network like I'm going to be talking about is uh, critical. To, to their continuation. Butterflies are extremely sensitive to herbicides and pesticides. That's part of the problem. Uh, even some organic pesticides are harmful to them. So even though the product might kill, not kill the butterfly immediately, uh, what it can do is cause birth defects in, uh, in that uh, butterfly's you know, babies. So um, even if you're even if you're using organic products, you still need to be very careful about how you do that. And I'll talk specifically about that. But if you are on an organic program, and we didn't ask our question, Emily, uh, how many of our uh, listeners, uh, participants are already organic gardeners? Yeah, Can okay, so, good? yeah, we have a poll question. Now we haven't tried this before. So <laughs> we're gonna try it. Um, okay, let me. Um, okay, so if you look on your Zoom, if you wiggle your mouse around, you'll see a poll section. And if you click mm -hmm. on there, we have two questions. Is your garden organic? And do you have a butterfly garden? Okay, okay we're getting a few votes. So. Everyone can go in there and vote. I voted, I voted too, so well, <laughs> one of them is mine. <laughs> okay, great. All right, it looks like we have some people with a garden or don't have a garden. So if some people are organic, some just don't have a garden. Mm -hmm. um, and then no one said they have a butterfly garden. So it looks like we're gonna <gasps> learn a lot of good stuff tonight. Okay, good. Well, um, once you've been organic or once you're on an organic program, uh, you really shouldn't need to use very much in the way of herbicides or pesticides because you're, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be allowing nature to take care of itself. So um, you're going to rely on uh, predatory insects like ladybugs and praying mantises uh, to take care of any problems that you have in the garden rather than you know, spraying things. So that will help to, um, to protect the more sensitive creatures in the garden and, and like the monarchs so that you're not uh, doing any unnecessary damage. So, um, my next slide um, is um, there are a lot of other benefits to being organic. If you have a garden, uh, you're going to end up spending less money because you're going to be using fewer products. You're not going to be spraying as much. Uh, once you've got your soil established and you have a good healthy soil, you can back off on fertilization and, and adding soil amendments and so forth. So again, you'll be putting less material into the garden. Uh, uh, having a garden that's non-toxic is going to be safer for you and your family and your pets. Uh, and you're going to be, as, as I've kind of already said, you know, promoting a more healthy ecosystem for the creatures that live in your garden. You're also going to be helping to protect our water supply because those toxins that you would have been using won't be going into the water supply, won't be going into the groundwater. 
And uh, you'll actually find it easier because you won't need to do as much. You won't be working against nature. You'll be working with it. Uh, so it'll be less work. Um, your soil is going to be more absorbent. So you use less water. And uh, it just in general, you're going you're gonna to be putting less material into the garden. So uh, you'll save money uh, a lot of different ways. Um, so getting more specifically into monarchs, um, monarchs are actually able to, to figure out who's, who's the boy and who's the girl without, um, without having to see each other, but because um, they use a, a pheromone that gives off a scent so that the male can identify the female. Uh, but they still have a visual way that you can tell the difference. So if you see monarchs in, in the garden, uh, the way that you can identify the male from the female is that the male has two little dots, and I can't point, unfortunately, to show you the dots, but on the right-hand picture on the male monarch, you'll see on the uh, hind wings toward the lower end of the butterfly, you'll see two dots that don't appear on the female butterfly in the, in the, next, in the picture next to it. So that's how you can tell the difference between males and females. Um, and um, once they've mated, the female monarch goes off and starts laying eggs. Um, and uh, interestingly, the female lays only one egg per plant. So she needs lots of plants in order to keep laying eggs. Uh, she has to keep mating and uh, keep finding new plants in order to keep laying eggs. Now another monarch can come along and, and lay an, another egg on the same plant, but those two eggs are going to be from two different monarchs. So um, if you see two eggs or more eggs, uh, that's because you've had more than one monarch pass through there. When the eggs hatch, uh, they go through a larval stage and um, the caterpillar emerges and on the picture on the left is what they look like when they first come out of their uh, egg. Uh, but they actually go through about four or five different stages, I believe uh, four stages. Uh, and by the time they're, um, they're mature, they're going to look more like the one on the right. Um, and they're, they're actually really pretty caterpillars. So um, they look similar to swallowtails, but swallowtails, will, you will not see a swallowtail on a milkweed and you will not see a monarch on a parsley plant. Um, monarchs have to have milkweed. That's the only thing they lay their eggs on. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk more about specific milkweed plants and, and so forth in a minute, but I want to finish up on how they, how they propagate themselves. Once the caterpillar is mature, it goes into what's called a chrysalis. And some people might call that a cocoon, uh, but the proper word is uh, for butterflies, the proper word is chrysalis. If you're a moth, then it's called a cocoon. But um, monarch uh, cocoons, if you will, are actually called a chrysalis. And they spend about eight to 15 days in this stage. And when they're ready to hatch out, they're gonna look like the, the one on the right where it's almost uh, translucent. You can actually see the butterfly wings inside the uh, chrysalis there. That means it's, um, it's getting ready to hatch. And um, the whole process from egg to hatch out into a butterfly is about 30 days. Um, it gets a little complicated how long they live because it depends on when they were born. But uh, the uh, first generation adults live for about six weeks. And the ones that actually migrate south uh, live longer, but we'll come back to that as well. The, um, as I mentioned, and a lot of you probably already know, um, monarchs absolutely have to have milkweed to breed on. That's the only plant they will lay their eggs on. 
Um, and then uh, the adults, in order to survive as they're flittering along looking for places to lay their eggs, they need to eat. Uh, and that means they need to have nectar plants. So it's very important if you have a butterfly garden that you provide both milkweed plants for the, the uh, breeding of the monarchs and that you also provide nectar plants for them to sustain the adults as they're traveling along. It's also helpful if you can put out um, some water for them. Uh, they really like um, like a shallow dish or um, some gravel with water in it uh, uh, so that they can perch on the side and then stick their proboscis into the water. They don't want to actually have to get wet. If they get wet, they can't fly. So they don't want to have to jump into the water to drink it. They want to stay on the edge and, and be able to drink without um, uh, getting into the water. So that's uh, another thing that you can offer them. Um, but um, it's one thing that's interesting about them is that monarchs will not drink the nectar of the milkweed plant. Other insects pollinate the milkweed. So there again, there's an example of the interconnection between the different animals um, in your garden. In order to have milkweed, you also have to have native bees to come and pollinate the milkweed so that the milkweed will grow so that the monarchs can lay their eggs on it. So it's all very interconnected. And um, uh, it takes a lot of, um, a lot of insects and, and other wildlife working together to make everything work the way it's supposed to work. But um, so anyway, milkweed plant belongs to the Asclepius family and there are actually over a hundred different kinds of milkweed in North America. But, um, and most of these the, the monarchs will live on. Uh, but many of these don't do well in Texas. So that's why I have an X through this one here. Um, the ones that, um, unfortunately, a lot of the growers in Texas only grow uh, the one I have in the picture here, which is a tropical milkweed. And it's not really suitable for North Texas. It's really more of a South Texas plant. And that's where the growers are, so that's what they grow. But that's not what we need up here in North Texas. And so we have actually been working really closely with our growers to try to get them to grow more of the milkweed types that we need for our area. And uh, so, so far we've been, we've made some progress with them and, and we're getting them to, to grow more of those types of plants. Uh, and we've been able to sell everything that they give us because there's so much demand for milkweed. So uh, anyway, the, um, the monarch plants, the monarch the milkweed plants that are going to be great for South Texas or for Oregon or, or uh, New Jersey or whatever are going to be different than the ones that, that we need to grow in our area. Um, and while it's not bad to plant other types of milkweed, um, one of the problems with just planting this one type is that we just don't have enough diversity and they need a lot of diversity in order to really thrive. And um, uh, if something were to happen to this type of plant, there wouldn't be anything for them to fall back on. So we need to try to look, try to, uh, to plant a variety, not just plant milkweed, but try to plant a variety of milkweed. And you'll find that um, each type has its niche in the environment. They each like a slightly different environment. And so, for example, uh, one of the uh, more, more common ones around here is called butterfly weed. It's the orange one here. And um, the um, orange one is a perennial with um, obviously bright orange flowers. It's 
blooms from May to September and it needs a lot of sunlight, but it's drought tolerant. It's, it loves the hot sun, the dry soil. It does great out in the middle of the Texas prairie. That's, that's where it's designed to live and thrive in. The one next to it, the swamp milkweed, uh, is uh, one that prefers moist soil. And that one grows in the wild. That one you're going to find more like along the edges of Lake Grapevine in the swampier areas and places like that where the soil is, is wet all the time. So um, you'll notice uh, I have a couple of handouts, and I don't know how to share those, Emily, but uh, those have uh, information about each of these different milkweeds that I'm talking about. And then I also have another handout with a list of the nectar plants that I'll be discussing. Yeah, if you and want. Um, I have a list of people who are attending, so I can always email those maybe tomorrow or whenever you get a chance, you can send them to me, then I can send them to the audience. Okay. Okay. Um, but anyway, uh, you'll, when you look at the um, detail on the handouts, you'll see that each of these milkweeds has its own little niche, like I said, and the um, uh, swamp milkweed prefers a wetter environment, the showy milkweed which I have up right now, is um, more shade tolerant. Uh, as I said, the butterfly weed, the orange one, likes to be out in the sun, the hot, dry, all of that. Um, whereas the showy milkweed likes a uh, little more shade and a uh, little more water. Um, and then the um, uh, other one next to it, the antelope horns, uh, which is also called spider milkweed. Uh, is another one that um, uh, needs a lot of sunlight and dry, hot, dry um, environment. Uh, but it blooms from March to October. So there again, um, one of the things about having this variety of milkweed is the fact that they bloom at different times. And it's really important to offer some something in bloom all the time so that you have different things blooming in the some things bloom in the spring but they only bloom for a month or maybe even only a couple of weeks uh, some things only bloom in the summer for two or three weeks while other things bloom in the fall so you need to have um, enough variety in your garden so that you've got things blooming throughout the entire uh, migration season, which is basically March through November. And um, there are a couple of other milkweed plants um, that um, you'll be able to read more about on the handouts. But uh, again, green milkweed and the wool milkweed are two more varieties that are good for our area that do very well in um, uh, our conditions. And these are all ones that, the, all the ones that I'm showing you are ones that we're, we're working with our growers to try to get. So uh, these are ones that we should be able to have available for you in the spring. They're not available right now because uh, it's just, they're not, it's not the right season for them. But um, in the spring, we should have a good selection of, of these different milkweed plants for you to plant in your garden. Um, so anyway, those are the milkweed plants. And again, they must have the milkweed to lay their eggs on. That's the only thing they'll lay their eggs on. Uh, but the adults do need a lot more variety. And these are just some pictures of uh, some of the various plants on our plant list that are good nectar plants for the monarchs. Um, a lot, as, as I kind of alluded to earlier, a lot of other insects rely on these same plants. Um, honeybees, as well as native bees like bumblebees, uh, mason bees, uh, all rely on these for their nectar sources. And um, uh, again, having something blooming throughout the entire March through November period is uh, is really valuable for the monarchs and for 
all of the other insects out there too. And for that matter, for reptiles and birds and, and uh, hummingbirds are another one that uh, need nectar. So having something for them is valuable too. Um, native plants are, excuse me, uh, native plants are preferable to exotic plants. Um, planting natives is, uh, native plants are actually um, more attractive to the native insects. And they're actually, they've done a lot of studies that show if they plant an exotic plant next to a native plant, uh, invariably the, the insect will prefer the native plant over the exotic and they think it's because that it's got more nutritional value. Um, so uh, if they're desperate they'll go to the exotic plant but they would much prefer to have natives. So as, as much as as many natives as you can plant uh, the better. Um, and then um, some, just some of the plants I have here in this picture that, that uh, would make good plants for your garden would be uh, cone flowers, which are on the upper left, uh, aster on the lower left, a butterfly bush in the center, and uh, dianthus on the upper right, and then uh, coreopsis. All of those are um, beautiful natives that grow in different uh, different sizes and shapes and colors. So there's just a lot of, a lot of options for your garden. There are also a lot of annual flowers that you can plant. These happen to all be perennials, uh, but you can also plant a lot of annuals uh, like alyssum and snapdragons and petunias and things like that. All of those are going to be uh, good nectar plants for monarchs. And so um, Texas plays a very unique role in the migration process. And that's really what makes monarchs different from all the other butterflies out there is the fact that they migrate. Um, they are the only butterfly known to make the complete two-way migration like birds make going from north in the, in the summer to south in the winter and back again. Um, the, but the southward migration is a lot different from the, from the north, northward migration that happens in the spring. Uh, it is really a truly remarkable thing that they're able to do this. Um, you'll see from this map that there's kind of uh, two separate um, uh, types of monarchs, there's two different migration paths. Uh, there are uh, what's called Western monarchs that live west of the Rocky Mountains, um, uh, which are gonna be traveling up and down the West Coast. And then there are the Eastern monarchs that live east of the Rocky Mountains um, and uh, migrate through, uh, through Texas. So we're part, our monarchs are part of that Eastern group. And then the Eastern group splits up into um, actually four different little uh, forks that, um, that split off as they, as they migrate. Um, and it's really, it's really complex what they're able to do. The, uh, the monarchs that migrate north in the spring are not the same monarchs that migrate south. In fact, each monarch only travels about a third of the way from their forest home down in that, that little dot down in Mexico, that circle is where they start from. And uh, in central Mexico, it's called the um, Oyamel Forest. And they all congregate there during the winter and then in the spring, uh, the ones that have been hibernating over the winter there come out of hibernation, they mate. And, uh, and then when their babies are born, those babies migrate north into uh, Texas and start uh, to lay their eggs uh, and spread out across Texas. 
And as they're traveling through Texas, they split into those uh, four different lines that you see there uh, going north. And uh, as I said, each mark only travels about a thousand miles or uh, a third of the way. So about a, a thousand miles total. They travel about a hundred miles a day, give or take. Some travel 50 miles, some, uh, you know, have actually been uh, 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 traveled like 200 miles, but on average, it's about a hundred miles a day. And um, they, uh, as they're flying, they stop and drink nectar and mate and lay more eggs. And then um, eventually they die and their babies continue the migration for the next thousand miles. And then those babies, the second generation, uh, they die and those, their babies finish the migration by ending up in uh, the northern U.S. and Canada. And then finally, another generation that hatches out in around August is the generation that migrates back south. So it's just incredible that somehow all these monarchs find their way all the way up north and um, they're not, none of them are the same monarchs that, um, that started the journey. So each monarch somehow knows exactly where they are on the, on the migration path at any given time and which direction they're supposed to go and what they're supposed to do when they get there. And so um, another interesting thing is that um, all of the Eastern monarchs, as they're coming back south, they will follow these same paths back south again and they will all converge on Texas and pass through Texas on their way back to the OML forest, forest. And so um, scientists have actually named this area where they all come together as the Texas funnel. And they think um, about 40% of the entire monarch population of North America passes through the Texas funnel. So we are in the perfect place to um, see monarchs, to interact with monarchs, and to help them with our gardens. And so um, another thing I thought was interesting was that um, you'll see on this map that um, the monarchs actually follow the same path as I-35. And uh, so somehow the monarchs had already figured out what the best route from uh, Texas to Duluth, Minnesota was, uh, you know, a few, few million years ago. Uh, and then our engineers came along and built a road and, and built it along the same path that the monarchs follow, which I thought was very interesting. Um, this is the same route that's followed by all the migratory species in North America. So it's, it's uh, I guess, not too surprising. But uh, when, when can we expect monarchs to come through here? This gives you a good idea, this picture here. Um, every year is a little bit different. Um, a lot of scientists track this migration very closely. Uh, they try to estimate how many monarchs are migrating, uh, where they are in the migration uh, cycle and when they are expected to make it back to the OML forest. Um, this year, uh, the population is actually a little bit uh, late. Uh, so this year, they're expecting it, the migration in Texas, uh, the number of monarchs in Texas to peak right around the middle of October. Uh, but this varies from year to year depending on the weather up north and um, what kind of um, uh, storms and whatnot are happening. Uh, wind um, coming up from the south can slow their journey because uh, they're flying into the wind and things like that. A lot of things can disrupt their 
their travels and slow them down or speed them up, depending on which way the wind is blowing. But generally speaking, they're gonna be uh, migrating through Texas in October and uh, the number of monarchs is gonna peak sometime during that month. So how do they find their way? Um, scientists still aren't really sure. Uh, there are several things they know and several things they think they know. Uh, one thing we know is that uh, they are receptive to day lengths. And so as we get into August and, and September, um, get past the equinox, the days start to shorten. Uh, the weather, the temperature is generally cooler and that's a signal to them that it's time to think about migrating. Uh, and uh, start pointing themselves in a southward direction. Um, another way that they think um, they know how to find their way is um, they think monarchs have a built-in magnetic compass. So um, they can actually, um, they actually have receptors, solar receptors in their antenna that, um, that provide them with both a timing cue and a directional cue that tells them which way south is. And uh, so those two things together tell them it's time to go south. Um, they also think that this, um, this works together with UV light somehow. So this, this part gets kind of scientific, but uh, another uh, thing that they think monarchs might do is they think monarchs might use what's called a sun compass. And uh, the sun compass requires that you be able to do geometry and, and trigonometry and stuff. So um, I would never be able to find my way using this method, but um, they um, would have to be able to know the angle of the sun and uh, calculate um, the, uh, um, um, by calculating the angle of the sun, they would know how far the, they are from uh, southward direction and so forth. And um, uh, the problem with that is if they were only using a sun compass, uh, they, would, they wouldn't be able to, they wouldn't funnel themselves down into one place. They would just all fly um, in a, you know, in kind of a southerly direction, but they wouldn't all come together at the same point like they do. So um, they think that they also use landmarks and by landmarks, they don't mean, oh, I see that uh, Bucky's sign on uh, I-35 and so I must be outside of Waco. Um, they, uh, they actually are influenced by uh, mountain ranges and things like that. Um, so as they're coming down toward Texas, uh, they have the Rocky Mountains on one side of them and uh, the uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico on the other. And so they don't want to fly over water and they don't want to fly over the mountains. So uh, those two um, pieces of geography just kind of force them into a narrower and narrower track uh, as they come down into Texas. And so uh, as they're traveling, they are um, only gonna be traveling during daylight hours. Uh, they can only see or fly during the day. And so uh, they have to rest at night, which means that they need to find a place to roost somewhere and, and rest. And uh, what they do is uh, they have points along the way that they use over and over again, even though these are different monarchs every year and these monarchs have never been to this place before, they somehow manage to find the same cedar tree and the same pine tree and the same fruit tree that uh, their great grandparents used um, 
when they were migrating and they congregate together in those areas uh, to keep warm and uh, to uh, probably to reassure each other that they're all on the right path. Um, and uh, it also helps them to uh, uh, regulate their, their temp body temperature and humidity and so on. So you can see tens of thousands of monarchs in these areas uh, that they are that they tend to roost in, uh, as they gather, as they travel south, the, the numbers get greater, and uh, you can, in places, you'll be able to see, you know, literally tens of thousands of monarchs in a single tree, uh, roosting overnight, as they're traveling south. Um, Another cool thing about monarchs is that they're able to calculate the shortest distance across open water. Uh, and when they do have to cross over water, they will sit and wait for a breeze to come up to help them across so that they don't have to flap their wings as hard. And uh, so they really are incredibly amazing creatures. And so um, anyway, when they get to where they're going, I'm sorry, I jumped a little too far ahead here. Um, when they finally get to, I'm going to go back to the map here, to the Oyamel Forest, uh, they, uh, I don't have a picture of them roosting, um, but on the map, sorry, I passed it. Again, they are going to um, all end up in this, where that little orange dot is down in central Mexico, which is actually a very small area in a very mountainous part of Mexico. And um, they flock to the trees that are on the south, southwest facing slopes, because those are the cooler uh, cooler slopes um, and uh, they have better protection from predators and they have better access to water. So that's where they congregate and they can actually have so many monarchs in a single tree that they can actually break the branches of the tree because together they end up being so heavy uh, that they can that they can damage the branch, which is uh, pretty amazing when you, you consider they only weigh like I don't, they don't weigh much of anything. Uh, so, but together they weigh a whole lot. So anyway, um, that uh, hopefully gives you a good idea of uh, how they live and how they get to where they're going and uh, how you can help them. Um, I think that's really the key for us is how can we help them to survive because their numbers have declined so dramatically just in such a short period of time. Uh, how can we help build those numbers back up again? And the key to that is really to find a way to recreate habitat. And um, we can't undo what we've already done. We can't turn our houses back into prairie. Uh, and so the only way we can really help them is to use the land that, that remains uh, to, to try to turn those into uh, what I call backyard biospheres, which support um, our, our sustainable uh, patches of, of land that support all of the, all of the wildlife that's native to our to our area, not just monarch butterflies, but all the butterflies and reptiles and um, even the raccoons and armadillos and so forth. And um, I know that's hard for some people to get used to, the get used to the idea of having critters in your yard and insects crawling on your plants. Um, but in the long run, um, you will find that it's, it's much more rewarding, I think, uh, for one thing. Um, but uh, if you're worried about um, having pests destroy your garden, um, you will really find that having a natural um, organic um, 
program in place will keep most of that under control and you won't need to spray. And another very important thing I want to mention before I wrap up here is that on the milkweed plants, um, they will be covered in aphids. I can guarantee you if you plant milkweed, if you have milkweed in your yard, it will be covered in aphids. And um, there's no conflict there <laughs> with the monarchs. Uh, the monarchs don't care about the aphids. The aphids don't kill the plant. Uh, they even, even though they swarm all over it, uh, they don't really do any serious damage to the plant. And so rather than trying to kill the aphids, um, it's actually better to just allow them to live on the plant, let the ladybugs come and eat the aphids. Um, the ants will also come in and eat the aphids uh, and they will um, uh, just all be happy together on that milkweed plant. So there really is no need for you to spray the milkweed. It's actually better to just leave those insects on there and, uh, and let nature do its thing. So anyway, um, the last thing I wanted to mention was if you are interested in growing a pollinator garden, uh, one way that you, you can make it more interesting for yourself is to get involved in some of these um, citizen science programs. And uh, um, as you saw in the first picture at the beginning of my presentation, uh, Marshall Grain is a, uh, an official Monarch Watch uh, habitat. We have our, our sign out there that we put out uh, showing that we are uh, a monarch habitat. Uh, there's no, um, I think the sign costs like 10 bucks or something, uh, but you can go to um, the um, monarchwatch.org slash waystations website and uh, apply for a um, a sign. Uh, you can also go to uh, millionpollinatorgardens.org and just register your garden. That's free. There's there's no charge involved in that. All you do is uh, put your your uh, name and address on the map, and it will uh, show your garden on there as part of the uh, more than a million pollinator gardens. Now they're well over a million. Uh, there are actually several million gardens now on the pollinator network and you can join that uh, and then you can also help track the monarch migration uh, by going to uh, journeynorth.org uh, you can actually get involved in in tagging monarchs and counting monarchs and reporting your sightings and things like that if you're into that sort of thing so there's all sorts of stuff and those are all great things to do with your kids so if you've got kids or grandkids or neighbor kids or or um anybody around who uh any little ones around these are all great things to do with them and get them involved and excited about um uh butterflies so with that, uh, I will ask Emily if there are any questions for me to answer. Great. Well, thank you for that wonderful presentation. I always love learning about monarchs. Uh, it's very cool that we live in such an awesome place for that. Um, so everyone, if you have questions, please put it in the chat or the Q&A. We do have one. I think it was towards the beginning when you were talking about um, organic gardening. Uh, mm -hmm. Kathleen asked about fleas. She said, what about fleas? I have dogs. So I think she's saying, can you still treat for fleas and be an organic garden? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, with um, your pets, they really recommend that um, you, you always do three things. That first of all, you treat the pet with some sort of flea control product. Um, the one that I use on my animals is Revolution. Um, it's a prescription only uh, one, but there are lots of other options. Uh, but you need to treat your pet, you need to treat the inside of your home, and you need to treat the outside of your home. And so you need to do all three of those things in, um, in tandem, in um, uh, concert because uh, if you just treat the pet 
the pet is going to constantly be getting new fleas jumping on them from outdoors. If you only treat the outside, uh, then every time your pet goes outside, they're going to get fleas on them and then they're going to bring them inside. So you have to do all three of those things. Uh, but when you treat outside, um, you don't need to use um, uh, anything that would hurt the monarchs. For example, for your lawn, which is where the fleas usually are, fleas and chiggers uh, love your lawn. That's where they want to be. They're not usually going to be in the shrubbery. Uh, mosquitoes are going to be in the shrubbery. But that's a different problem. Uh, but for fleas, uh, you want to treat the, the lawn. And for that, all you really need to do is put down diatomaceous earth, which is completely safe, uh, won't hurt um, the won't hurt caterpillars at all. Uh, it only hurts insects that have an exoskeleton. Um, in fact, it won't even hurt ants. Unfortunately, it won't hurt fire ants, uh, but it will kill fleas, flies, um, uh, it will kill uh, ticks, it will kill uh, chiggers, uh, it will kill a whole range of insects that are crawling around in the lawn. And it will continue to work as long as your um, your, the, as long as the product is dry. So if you put it down and a week later you turn on your sprinklers or it rains or something like that, uh, it's going to become ineffective uh, and then you'll have to reapply it. But as long as the lawn is dry, it's going to keep working. And um, uh, so I would put, I put diatomaceous earth down whether I think I have fleas or not, uh, just because it's a great way to control a lot of those nuisance insects that jump on us, you know, when we're walking around out in the garden and, and try to bite us. Um, and uh, it's, it's great to actually, you can actually use it as a flea control on your pet uh, and you can use it in your home as well. So uh, you can put it on your dog as a, as a like a flea powder uh, you can even put some in their food and it will help get rid of um, internal parasites. Uh, so if the fleas give your dog worms, uh, you can give your dog diatomaceous earth to eat and it will clear out the intestinal tract and get rid of those worms from their system. Uh, and then you can even put it on your carpeting uh, like you would with the flea powders that you buy in the grocery store or whatever, instead of using those which have poison in them, uh, you can just use the diatomaceous earth. You can put it down on your carpet, leave it for a couple of hours, and then vacuum it up, or you can just leave it on your carpet. Uh, you know, um, I happen to have a carpet that that um, is sort of a camouflage color, so uh, I can put you know, the, you only need a light dusting. It's not like you need to, to put a whole lot of it down. So you just put a light dusting of this on your carpet and it'll disappear into the carpet and it'll keep working as long as, again, as long as it stays dry. So unless you spill your wine on it or something like that, uh, it's gonna keep working. So I hope that answers your question. And we'll see if we have any other questions. Great. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, so if anyone does, please put them in. Um, I'll just ask a quick question, and it might be kind of ignorant. Um, I live in an apartment, so I don't oh. have a garden, but I'm just <laughs> curious. Um, so, you know, today we talked about fall gardening, butterfly gardening for monarchs. I know there's a lot in the spring, too, that people will talk about pollinators. Do you have any tips, mm -hmm. the best way to support pollinators all year round? Or is it really? Yeah, well, uh, is what? I'm sorry. I said, or does it really depend on the season? Well, uh, it really, um, you know, as I kind of touched on earlier, what what you really need to do is have um, something blooming all the time. So uh, there are, you know, a lot of plants that only bloom in the spring. 
and uh, like a lot of annuals that are only going to bloom in the spring. Uh, you know, um, some will bloom like petunias, for example, you can plant in the early spring and then you can, they'll die in the summer, but then you can grow them again in the fall, you know, but they, but they don't like the heat. So they'll die over the summertime. Um, so you want to have um, some, uh, you know, a variety of plants that are blooming in the spring, a variety of plants that are blooming during the summer, and then a variety of plants that bloom in the fall. And however you do that, there's, you know, there's really an infinite number of combinations of, of plants and uh, that, you can, that you can plant to meet that criteria, but you want to just have, um, you want to have stuff that comes out real early. Again, like they start migrating in March and that's when um, a lot of other insects start coming out. Uh, that's when blue bonnets start blooming. Um, that's when um, other butterflies start coming out. Uh, that's when, um, Hummingbirds start to migrate also is in March. Uh, I don't think they get to Texas until June or something like that. But, um, and then there are a lot of, um, you know, insects and, and reptiles and stuff that, that live here all year round um, that are gonna be hibernating over the winter and they're gonna come out depending on the weather, of course, uh, they're gonna come out in late February, early March, something like that. And so you want to have something ready for them when they first start waking up for the spring. And then you want to, um, you know, continue that so that you've got, you know, again, something blooming in the late spring, something blooming in the summer, and then again in the fall. And if you can have something blooming all the way through November, because if the migration is late, for example, and they don't get back to the to Mexico at their usual time, there would still be something for them to forage on in the meantime. Great, thank you. Um, okay, let's see. I think we have time for one more question. Um, Kathleen asked, are begonias good food plants? Um, Yes, they would be a good nectar plant. You can, um, uh, those would be annuals. So, uh, and they're gonna be, they, they kind of get raggedy looking in the summer. They don't, they don't look all that great, but um, basically as long as they're blooming, uh, they can continue to be, you know, a, a source for the butterflies and not just monarchs, but again, for bees and for, um, uh, the other butterflies, swallowtails, and and the the yellow sulfur ones, and all of that. Um, those are all going to be looking for nectar plants too, and they're going to be around pretty much the entire um, you know that entire March to November uh, time frame. Whereas the monarchs are just going to be they're going to pass through in the spring, and then they're going to pass through in the fall. Uh, and you're not going to really see any in the summertime, but um, uh, you know the other butterflies are going to be around, and and other insects that are going to need those nectar plants. Well, great, awesome. Um, okay, well that takes us past seven, so I think it's time to wrap up. Well, thank you okay. for coming. Thank you so much, um, Joyce, for giving our presentation today. That was very educational. I want to let everyone know this was recorded, um, so it will be on our website eventually, um, probably sometime next week. Um, so if you want to <laughs> share it with your friends or family, uh, feel free to do so. Um, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, just be organic. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, and have a great night.